ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the, I now think the seventh installment of the Kurzweil podcast. We have a spectacular guest on with us today. This is Ben Hart, who currently works at GE Renewable Energy as a product analytics team lead. Is that correct, Ben? I think that's accurate enough. Yeah. So basically, he's the guy who's crunching all the numbers and the data and making that company and that division for which he works more efficient. Now, I'm going to try and, or I was going to, and planning on introducing Ben. We actually talked offline for about five minutes. There's a 0% chance that I could do this man's background and repertoire any justice. So first, I want to say, Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. And could you please introduce to the listeners who you are, what you do, and your background now at GE? Sure. And Dan, thanks for having me in. I really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a question I've got asked a lot of times in my life, and it never has like an easy answer, unfortunately. <laughs> so, I get uh, it. as I was saying to you, I think before the call, like I've always kind of been a serial problem solver. So I got brought into GE as a product manager. If you look at my resume prior to that, that may not make a bunch of sense. So we can dive into that rabbit hole uh, maybe later. Uh, but brought in as a product manager, and I was given a portion of the product. So um, uh, at that point in time, we had a fairly large product development team, and that portion of the product was a fr uh, product management was fairly technical in nature. Um, so realized that hey, we were getting asked some really tough questions. Um, the only way to answer these questions with any sort of accuracy was I had to start diving into the data, find where the data lived, and and creating these models to get these answers quickly. Um, when I got the answers, everybody's like, oh, give me that. I go, oh, we want that. Yeah, get, and can you do it with this and that? And can you get us more? And so um, quickly realized that, that we had a lot of tough questions. Um, and the only way to get these solutions was to start working in the data a bunch. So put together a proposal for a team uh, that would do that. Um, at the same time, I got handed a, a pro program management role. Uh, which was kind of out of left field. So I ended up program managing this uh, program that helped us get our turbines certified for longer life. That's how you and I met on LinkedIn. Yes. As you said, hey, the 116 is a cool product. And I was like, yeah, it's real cool because it lasts for 40 years, which is uh, blowing everybody else out of the water on the industry, not to tutor horn too much. But um, so yeah, I, I took that product, that program on, uh, guided that through to solution to, to to the, the final product, which is a uh, certification. Meanwhile, got this team kind of up and running and then um, transferred over to that team 100%. So lead a team of four people. We, we do data analytics uh, to help the product development cycle. That's, uh, that's incredible, firstly. And I, I want to dive into um, your experience as a GE employee um, here shortly. But first, I want to understand personally I saw on your LinkedIn, it says dual major, marine engineering operations, and small vessel operations. <laughs> how, how does somebody who goes to Maine Maritime Academy end up in wind when your background is in, it seems like, marine uh, yeah. operations? Can you, can you walk me through, you know, what, what led you down that path, path initially in college and then kind of that evolution of you getting into the wind energy sector? Sure. Yeah, great question. So, Maine Maritime Academy is a, a plug for them. They're super cool school in that uh, when you get your degree, specifically the engineering degrees, they got this very heavy hands-on side of it. So you, you learn all the technical background, you learn the physics and the calculus and the strength of materials and all that stuff. Um, but you also learn how to work on all the things you learn about. So, you know, if you're going to talk about the uh, physics of a diesel engine, uh, one semester, the next semester, you're literally going to rip down an entire diesel engine, rebuild it, or start working on a 10,000 horsepower marine diesel. Um, so you get this very hands-on aspect. I've always been um, uh, drawn to renewable energy green stuff since I was a little kid. Um, graduating in 2008, I, by the way, I went to college a little bit later. Um, started at 25, graduated at 28. So uh, when I graduated in 2008, Wind industry was still in, in its infancy. I think if we remember back 11 years ago, there was some good potential, but still pretty small. So there's no jobs for wind. I really did push super hard, tried for like two and a half years, went to a bunch of symposiums and, and AWEA, and I did all this stuff, and it just wasn't any jobs available. 
Um, so I took a career path that brought me through the manufacturing sector. I was a reliability engineer. Um, and then I, it was in the uh, paper industry. Paper industry was really tailing out in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I said, hey, I need something with, with a better option, better opportunities. And uh, really the only option available to me was uh, an entry-level position on an oil rig using my marine engineering license. Uh, so this was like literally cleaning toilets. Um, wow. <laughs> and fixing toilets. So I, I was like 31. I had a couple kids and I was like, all right, man, I want to get out of the paper industry. Let's do it. So uh, just went and uh, got two promotions within like a month and a half, just to kind of being in the right place, the right time, maybe having the right skill set. Um, and then started leading maintenance teams on these offshore rigs. Uh, so I did that for about five years, six years total. But, you know, after those promotions, I was leading these teams for about five years. Uh, took a couple uh, big drill ships out of the yard. So these are like billion plus dollar uh, projects. Yeah, they're huge. Wow. So I wasn't leading those. I was leading a team of um, uh, commissioning people. So... Commissioned them, brought them out, brought them into service, and then came back to an, another one, did the same thing, commissioning, brought it out, brought it into service. Um, and then the wind industry was really hitting a stride, and uh, I wanted, and I kind of wanted from the very start to get out of the oil industry. Uh, started pushing real hard uh, around 26, I don't know, 2014. And again, two years pushing, flexing my network, trying to meet people. LinkedIn was a huge part of it. Um, really just like talking to as many people as I possibly could. And then right around 2016, met a couple of people at GE, uh, developed some relationships with them, uh, discovered there was a lifelong friend of my brother's that worked at GE. Oh, cool. Long, yeah, which is super helpful because it's not like, uh, it's not the good old boy network. You know, he didn't get me a job, but he had direct access to jobs. And he was like, here's, here's some postings. Here's the kind of roles that would fit uh, your experience. And uh, yeah, and then uh, applied. And that gap from leading uh, teams, running maintenance on oil rigs to becoming a product manager, um, those are very far apart. <laughs> so that gap got closed. The only thing I can think is that I had a good interview and I actually started a business uh, doing consulting work in the marine uh, and manufacturing space. And uh, so I guess managing your own business, you learn about the finance side of things. So they, that, that's really important for being a product manager. Mm -hmm. so I think they saw that technical expertise, a little bit of hands-on, which they liked, and then that financial bit. And it, I guess, amalgated to be something that they, they thought would fit the role. So when did you start developing all this data and analytics skill set? Was this something that you had coming out of school in 08? Or was this uh, something that you were able to learn over time, maybe even just doing your own consulting with the financial side? Um, yeah. and, and how did you ultimately implement that at GE now? You know, I kind of want to understand yeah. from the degree to now data and analytics is what you eat, sleep and breathe. You know, <laughs> how does that come to be? Yeah, it's a funny thing. Um, I would say that like, especially these days, a skill set that is super important to develop is the ability to adapt and to adapt like at the speed of light. So that was something that I, I guess was kind of innate and developed over time was just being highly adaptable and very curious and constantly educating myself. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question, in college, I used super basic analytics, Excel-based stuff to do silly things like track my expenses and manage my budgets. And, you know, if I was, I, I, I put myself through college by building houses uh, for people. I just had a little, it was my own business, um, ran a crew of like 10, 10 kids. Um, and we would we would do odd jobs or build houses or rebuild houses or whatever. So, you know, a little project management here and there, budget management spreadsheets, nothing too serious. And it just got more and more complex as my jobs took on more responsibilities. And where I was at the, you know, when I was at the oil rigs, I uh, it was maybe four years before I left. So maybe halfway in my career in the oil rigs, um, I, you know, I was I paying attention to the news and I was like, you know, hey, this, this Python coding, coding is something that seems to be everybody's talking about it. 
And I should probably learn some of that or like learn why it's important. So I started doing it. Uh, I'm, I'm still not a good Python coder, but I learned what it was for and why we used it and um, used kind of those concepts to help understand these bigger data sets we were working with. Then as mentioned, got into GE. And when I got into GE, it just immediately saw that like, hey, there, these these questions, the answers to these questions change like minute to minute, sometimes second to second. So when you start saying like, hey, what what are we selling and where and to whom and for how much, but those type things, um, that's that's not a static thing. So it's not like I can get an answer to that and it holds true for a month. Like I can get an answer to that and it holds true for like 11 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so I, I the only way to keep it doing is to have this live live code that's always looking at where the data lives and pulling it in and, and visualizing it. So just taught myself how to do that, uh, used it as I mentioned, and then realized that my skill set went to here, and I needed some people with skill sets way over here. So uh, yeah, pitched to leadership and was like, hey, let's put together a team of people with skill sets out here, and they they were all about it. That's uh, that's phenomenal, uh, especially now that you have a team underneath you using data and analytics. I'd be curious, and you, if you can't divulge, I totally mm -hmm. understand, but what sorts of challenges did you initially run into where mm -hmm. analytics and your data background were able to step in and say, hey, here's the problem that we can solve, even if it's in 11 seconds, mm -hmm. you know, in the time frame that we do solve it, you know, here are some of the things that I can bring to the table to solve some of the challenges that we're running into as a renewable energy manufacturer, turbine manufacturer. Could you walk me through some of the examples of that? Sure, yeah. And, and I think fortunately, the problems we experience are not gonna be unique to GE. It's probably common amongst every business, or it's been common amongst every business, I understand. But um, you know, the problems relate around like customer requirements management. Like, hey, if we sell something to a customer, there's a whole bunch of things we need to know, like what have we sold and, and when is the timing that we said we're going to deliver what we sold and what is the timing of their requirements and what's the conditions of the contract and, and how much have we sold it for and how much is it going to cost us to make it. And, and so there's thousands of these data points related to every single time we sell a turbine to somebody or even discuss selling a turbine to somebody. Um, so we, you know, that's all recorded or it should be in, in a system. We use Salesforce, but it could be whatever. Um, and so, you, you know, helping you understand what is the market asking for, what are we giving to the market? That is super dynamic because we've got thousands of people out there selling thousands of wind farms to thousands of different customers. And it literally changes minute to minute, second to second. So that, you know, that's one. And then there's all these engineering as you develop a product. Um, you know, if you say, hey, I'm going to build this glass and, 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 and this glass we've decided is going to withstand a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. How do I go do that? I made that commitment. I told the customer this glass is going to make a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so how do we go make sure we're going to make sure that that uh, glass makes a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. So there's all these like validation points and uh, different data points. And so it, it quickly, as you can see, especially when you're standing in the middle there at that product development where you're saying, I need to know what the customer needs and I need to know what we can actually do on the engineering side. It's hyper complex. Oh, I can only imagine. So how yeah. do you anticipate all this data and analytics that you're collecting and tracking? How do you anticipate this will streamline not only manufacturing of these turbines, but also the technological advancements of these turbines? I mean, you talk about 2008, um, you're graduating from college at, I think, 28 years old, couple kids at home. At that point, I think GE's largest platform was the 1.5 megawatt, mm -hmm. maybe the 1.6, 100. I'm not sure if I've seen any wind farms, but the 1.6, 100 here in the United States, at least. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how did analytics and data tie into engineering and the rapid growth just over the last decade to now a 5.3 megawatt Cypress platform? I think it's a 160 meter rotor, 158, 158, yeah. 158 meter rotor. It's a monster. What, oh, it's a, it is a monster. And then you have the Halley 8X, the offshore turbine also. How did data and analytics tie into the, the rapid advancement of these technologies within GE? I mean, it's, it's just yeah. fascinating. To me. It is fascinating. That's an awesome question because I think there's two things that kind of play into it. Two analogies that I think of. 
Um, one is, is, you know, if you think of product development as kind of a machine with these mechanical linkages. So, you know, you've got some gear turning another gear that's turning a lever. And if anybody's familiar with mechanical engineering, there's this concept called hysteresis, where if I turn this gear and I've got seven gears that run another one, how far do I have to turn this one before the final one turns? So if I've got 30% hysteresis, that means I can turn this a third of a turn and this doesn't even move. And if I turn it back a third of a turn, that doesn't even move. So what we found in the business process using that analogy is that, you know, you've got this market analysis, and then you've got this engineering review, and then you've got this and that and the commercial and all these different mechanical pieces. And it's not seven gears, it's like 700 gears. And the more you can reduce that hysteresis. So like if I turn this lever over here and I say, oh, our market, we think our market's changed. So we don't need a 48158. We need a 55158. How quickly can I affect everything down the line to say, engineer, go design this new part that's gonna allow us to have a 55? So that, to me, data and analytics takes that hysteresis out or reduces it. So if we've got 30% loss and noise in what we're doing, how can we take that from 30% to 5% just to increase the speed which we can react to our customers, to ourselves, to our suppliers, to our manufacturers, you know, so if our manufacturer says, hey, look, I, I, I'm out of bolts, X, Y, Z. How fast can we find that out and spool up to go find a replacement so that our end customer doesn't get hurt? And unless, unless that hysteresis is very little, then sometimes I can take, you know, I think back even three years ago, things like that could take a month. And then you're in, in trouble. Whereas if you can get it down to take like, an hour and a half, somebody knows, huge difference. Um, so that's one analogy. And then the second analogy is with these turbines, um, and I think any product in general, we're trying to make them cost as little as much, as little as they possibly can, you know, lowest cost they can possibly have, uh, run as absolutely hard as they can, make the most power you can out of that thing, right to the edge, right? and then make them last as long as they possibly can. And those three things don't collaborate well together, right? So if, I'm gonna, <laughs> if I'm gonna take cost out of something and run it harder, it doesn't necessarily always mean it's gonna last longer, but those are our requirements. Like it has to do all three. So the analogy I run is essentially, is we're on a road and it's a car and it's got these ditches on the side. And you know, 10 years ago, the ditches were really shallow, the road was really wide, and the car was going like 10 miles an hour. Now, the car is going like 5,000 miles an hour. The road is the width of the car, and the ditches are like vertical on each side, and they're 100 foot deep. So like we have to really know what we're doing before we do it, and we got to quadruple validate it. So data and analytics help us do that to say like, hey, we are saying we're gonna go 5,000 miles on this road that's the width of the car that has these 100 foot drop offs on each side. Is this the width of the road? Is this how wide our car is? And is this the direction our car is actually going, right? So you just, yeah. So those two analogies I think really show how data and analytics play a big part. That's a fantastic analogy too. Um, I, I'd be curious, you know, we, we connected on LinkedIn. You had said the traditional 20 years you didn't necessarily say this, but what I extrapolated out was the 20 years might be obsoleted at some point with GE products, the 20 year life of these towers. You've now mm -hmm. moved on to 40 years life expectancy on the Cypress platform. How in the heck did you guys do it? I mean, it's far outside of my pay grade in understanding, but I'd be curious to hear from at least your perspective. How do you double the life of a, of a turbine that's basically redlining and utilizing your analogy going on a a road, the width of the car with hundred foot cliffs on either side. How in the heck do you do that? Yeah. So let me, let's set, set something straight. The, the uh, Cypress platform has not been certified for 40 years. So we've got two platforms that have, it's our 116 and our 127. They're both uh, in the, in the America's market. Mostly it's called megawatt constrained for us. Yeah. Um, so, so what we did is it's a combination of a lot of different stuff as with everything, any system, there's, there's a ton, a ton of parameters. And we start looking at all that whole entire system to systems unit and say, okay, what parameters can we tweak? Can we improve materials? Can we improve our understanding of the materials? That's a big part. Um, saying like, hey, our model may have said the steel can handle this kind of stresses. 
uh, is our model right? Turns out our model can be refined and maybe this some portion of the model we didn't fully understand, we can tweak to get more, more life out of that material by using different methodologies. So um, there's control strategies get involved, maintenance strategies get involved, uh, 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 product replacement or, or uh, component replacement type stuff like, um, uh, you know, maybe you got to replace a, a, a cooler or a set of hoses or something like that and do it proactively so that you're not causing a failure which would cause the turbine to get damaged. Um, and, 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 and then plus, you know, looking at 10 years of historic field data and failures. And, and, and so when you start to get this kind of mass of information together and, and start to be able to connect it logically with, with math and with analysis, you can start to realize, oh, look, what we thought traditionally would make 20 years with these tweaks, turns out it can make 40 years and maybe beyond. Um, but the, you know, the important thing too, and this gets super hyper-technical, so I won't, I won't go too far into it, but um, this is not unique. You know, every industry does this as it starts to reach a level of maturity. They say, we have this base level that we've designed our, whatever, our ship to, or our power plant to, we say it's 20 years, we say it's 10 years, or we say whatever it is. The product goes out and it starts getting used and we get data points back and we say, okay, well, if you look at X, Y, and Z, you can go beyond 10 years, you can go beyond 20 years. You can run this thing safely, which is the important thing. You can run this thing safely for longer periods of time. So that's, that, that's a, a very, very, very short answer to what is a hyper, hyper technical, super long uh, discussion. Oh, it's the complexities of a wind turbine in general are mind boggling to me. Um, just being about a year into the industry, I'm fascinated by the technology, the different components, how you can source different types of components for the components. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to me, just having to dive into all that data and go one by one, picking out each individual component within the tower and saying, okay, historically, like you said, over the last 10 years, maybe this part fails once every five years. And correct me if I'm wrong, kind of trying to extrapolate what you said into mm -hmm. my understanding. This has failed every five years. Thus, every four years, we would recommend as a preventative maintenance cycle, we replace this. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, up and downstream effects won't happen. So right. other, thing, other parts and components won't fail, therefore increasing the life. While you guys are still taking advantage of the technological advancements of the R&D that you're pumping into these turbines. Right. Yeah, that and correct? that's more or less correct. I think uh, a lot of it mostly is data collection. Is it, It's to go out and essentially look at these turbines and test these turbines and use your sensor data and all this stuff to understand what is happening. Because as everybody knows, model uh, and reality, model never 100% accurately reflects reality. And, and, it's, and it's, it's a really a statistical impossibility to say like, I'm going to predict exactly what happens to every turbine ever. There's 54,000 of them out there. So you say, okay, the probabilistic, probabilistically, the probability says that this will probably happen. But the only way we can know what's going to happen to that turbine itself is to go monitor it and look at it. So to your point, it's like, okay, we say that probabilistically, component X, is likely to fail in some sort of time frame XYZ. So do these things so that you can start to understand, is it failing? And it maybe it's failing before, maybe it's failing after, maybe it never fails. But we rarely, rarely say, it doesn't make any sense for us to say, re replace component X at time Y because, just period, do it. Because it, again, we can't predict what's gonna happen at that site. So, um, wow, yeah. So it sounds like you're taking more of a holistic approach in evaluating the turbine's health. And each individual site turbine is contextualized and evaluated based on its performance off the data that you're collecting, all the sensors like you had mentioned up tower. To me, that's, that's incredible that you're able to monitor that with such a, a, you know, a fine lens, such a magnified lens for all of your mm -hmm. customers. So how... Sure. So it's not us, yeah, yeah. So just so we're clear, so if we own the service contract, sure, it may be us. Yes. If uh, somebody's a self performer, it's on. It, no, it'll be up to them. Mm -hmm. But again, we we're going to provide as clear possible guidance to them to say, like, hey, if you're going to go do this, do it like X, Y, Z. Um, but yeah, it, it's it, that gets into a complicated thing where you're talking about sure. self self performer versus uh, the OEM performing and stuff. But yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. We, we've seen both different types of the, uh, the aftermarket. So I, I definitely understand the differences there. Um, I, I wanted to talk about just the, the monitoring, uh, part of me, the monitoring technology up tower. Um, yeah. Do you have much experience with how it's grown and become increasingly more focused on data? I'd imagine in 2008, the capabilities of the data you can collect from the tower are way different than what we can now collect on this new Cypress platform or the 2X or the 3X platform. Sure. Could you walk me through just some of the differences and what you guys are really looking into? I can talk similar, somewhere rarely. I can't talk in great detail because mm -hmm. I don't work. I work on data, but I don't actually, we call it machine data, sensor data. I don't work directly in sensor data. So um, I will say that at the high level, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're pulling a lot more data from our machines than we were historically. And I think it grows like every minute, right? <laughs> so um, because again, to, to the point that as we're, driving this car faster on a narrow road with, with, with greater consequences, we really want to understand what's the car doing as it's driving down the road. So what is the turbine doing as it's experiencing 14 meters per second of wind? Um, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry, sorry, my wife just came in. You're good. We can edit it out too. Okay, no worries. I am on a podcast with, with Dan. So <laughs> She about faced out here. <laughs> so, um, Tell her I say I, hello, by the way. Thank you for letting me steal your time. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. Uh, all right. So back where we were going. Uh, so the more information we can gather and the more we can do with it, the better we get at, at designing both these turbines, the new ones, and then supporting our customers after the turbines are going out into the field. Um, and there when you get that quantity of data and that complexity of data back, uh, the potential is is astronomical of what you can do with it. And and it's it's super exhilarating and exciting to see, I can't talk about any of it, but talk, but to see the ideas that come out of the people that are playing in this data and say like, oh look, we can do this and we can do that. And and um, I think but again, it's one of those touchy things. I think some other industries are seeing this too. It, it, it can also reach a point of diminishing returns. If you're taking in too much, um, you're paying a lot of money for transferring that data around and you maybe not are using it. So there's a, I think there's probably going to reach a point where you're having maybe this exponential growth of data collection maybe starts to taper out and uh, maybe enjoy a more linear growth. Uh, and then we start to more work more closely with our customers to help them capitalize on it. That's uh, all of this data and analytics to me. Um, I, I, I'm just excited to see what we come up with in the future. You know, we're, we're seeing all these different platforms rolling out. The, the size of the turbines, especially offshore, are becoming astronomically larger. It, it seems like we left the infancy stage of wind, um, probably 2012, maybe, maybe even sooner. And we've quickly throttled past being a toddler to now we're almost a teen entering into our young adult years. So what, yeah. what gets you most excited looking ahead to the future of wind in the United States and it's seemingly, you know, consensual adoption? Yeah. I mean, it's the cost competitive. It's like that everything makes sense now and there's no, any, Anybody who would say, um, oh, you know, we shouldn't be doing wind power because of X, Y, Z. And there's kind of like these common tropes you know, they say, oh, we shouldn't be doing it because uh, it's not cost competitive or we shouldn't be doing it because it, uh, it's inefficient or we shouldn't be doing it because it's intermittent or, or whatever. Um, there's so much momentum behind it now and there's so much investment in it and, and it's proven itself over and over again that that those those arguments are one by one just kind of getting put to bed saying like okay economics look i understand absolutely 10 years ago not cost competitive now and in the next two years we are going to be cost competitive if not better than any power generation on the market and it all also depends you know there's different metrics to measure that but in general, the way we look at it and how we calculate those metrics looking forward, we think that like absolutely we're going to be competitive economically in, in just about any market um, as long as there's wind. Uh, 
you know, supplementary technologies like GE hybrids is getting involved now and, and being able to work uh, hand in hand with solar and storage. Um, even who knows, working with like a quick cycle gas turbine, whatever. There's a lot of solutions that we're getting uh, closer and closer to that just make wind a, a concrete part of the reality of the, the energy mix going forward until we invent fusion, then it's all over, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that might be a few decades, a lot yeah. longer. <laughs> yeah. So I think that makes me the most excited is that like, Hey, I really believe in the technology. I think we are doing the right thing. Like this is a clean technology. This is my daughter. Hey. Um, this is a clean technology. It's, I, I genuinely believe that it, it is, uh, um, this is something interesting if you talk to people in the industry too. I'd say a good 80 plus percent, maybe 90, maybe more percent of the people that work there, like we really believe in this product. We're not just doing it because it makes a paycheck for us. Like we're here because we are like, this is the, the one of the best options for answering our solution to creating energy. So it's, it's green, it's clean, it's economic. Um, it's we're producing great stuff like the 116 platform the 127 platform for GE is just absolutely knocking it out of the park customers love it you know we are super stoked with the results of it um, yeah so it's a, a combination of all those things I just feel like we're doing good work work that matters is helping the world get to, to a, a, a better spot and uh, and doing it and it makes sense, right? Like we're not relying on somebody to give us money to make it make sense. It just makes sense. Correct. Yeah, having it make economic sense is obviously going to help us win over the consensus of the rest of the nation, you know, as mm -hmm. we move forward. And you see articles on LinkedIn or uh, the New York Times, any other major publication, they're talking about how the government is stepping away from wind and it's able to uh, basically prop itself up on the back of producing cheap power uh, mm -hmm. efficiently and, as you say, you know, a green source of power. And to me, that's where my passion comes from. Obviously, you're a passionate guy and super enthusiastic about wind. Um, tie that in with storage capabilities. Yeah. And I'm sure that those technologies are maturing. Um, I've heard we're a decade out. It wouldn't surprise me if it was even quicker than that. I know some yeah. energy companies now are testing out the, the battery storage capabilities tying all that in together is going to really open us up to a ton of opportunity to continue to expand wind in the United States. And I guarantee you GE is going to be an integral part of that. Yeah, we um, certainly hope to be. <laughs> oh, and I, I believe it. I mean, I've, I've seen uh, and actually spoke with some of uh, your newer sites. Um, I think you said it's the 117 uh, meter rotor. Is that the, that's the 275 platform or is that a 25? Megawatt yeah, turbine. So there's so the it's a 127. There is a 117 that's overseas uh, and that's still in development. But yeah, so the 127 uh, ranges from let me get this wrong, two <laughs> two maybe to two eight. Uh, okay. I know for sure we've sold a bunch of two five and two eight. Um, maybe two two was on the on the books for a little while and, and went away. But yeah, so we've sold a few thousand of the uh, two fives and two eights. I did go to a, I believe it was a 2.5 megawatt site. Don't hold okay. me to that, but I'm almost 100% certain. And yeah. I actually wrote it down in, in my notes here before. Verbatim, this guy said, it runs like a Cadillac. <laughs> so I walked onto the site. I'm like, man, I got to learn about these turbines. The yeah. blades are long. It looks like a GE tower. What is this? Yeah. And uh, it was the site manager, one of the guys working on site. He's all, buddy. This is the greatest turbine that you can ever operate on. It runs like a Cadillac. And yeah. from there, you can't help just walking away smiling, seeing how the technology has advanced. And I'm sure your team, looking at the data, has played an integral role in that. Um, yeah. So I wanted to thank you for your work and just kudos for what you've been able to do with, with the advancement of these towers and the turbine technology. Yeah, yeah, it's super exciting for us to be honest. Like the, you know, those when you put out any new product, I'm sure every business feels the same way. But you, when you put out any new product, you know, you have faith in it. You've done all your due diligence. You're excited about it. But part of you is kind of, you know, it's got a little trepidation. You're going, what's this, you know, what's it going to do in the field? Is it going to sell? And then when it starts to sell, you go, okay, great. Is it? Are we going to be able to deliver? Can we ramp up manufacturing? And then your manufacturing ramps up. Are we going to be able to install these? And you get the installation. It's kind of these things that keep going. And then 
when they get out in the field and you start gathering data from them and a year goes by and all of a sudden you're saying like, yeah, we're, we're killing it. We're making our power curves or beating our power curves and our reliability is where it needs to be. Our warranty spends where it needs to be. Everything's where it needs to be. And the customers are enthusiastic. The guys, gals love working on them. Like there's no complaints. You almost, it's tough because you're always back into the next product you're developing, but you almost have to take a step back and be like, all right, High fives around, man. We, did. <laughs> like we got it. This is a great product. And I would say the last year has really been that to just, when we can decouple, look at that 116 and the 127, be like, hey, we did a good job. These are great products. Oh, that's, that's awesome. I want to talk about, you know, giving high fives and your biggest wins. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was, what's been your biggest win since you came on board with GE Renewables? Either that's personal or professional. I think the process of even getting hired on, and that was a, a dream of yours for so long, that would be a win. But I'm going yeah. to uh, ex exclude that one from, from your answer. And I'd like to hear, you know, another big win that you've been able to experience. Sure. So um, I would say, like, there's been a, a, a bunch of them, but I'll say three. Like, one is, is more like a win for the business. I think when we released the 127, uh, which was the which was the next progression from the 116, um, we were excited. We said, "Hey, you know, we think this is going to be a really good product. It's got better capacity factor and more reliability, and on and on, all this stuff, all these improvements, costing out, and everything. We think it's going to be a great product." And so we did these forward-looking projections, and we said, "All right, we're going to sell X of these turbines." And we went to a WIA that year. And came back from Awea and everybody's like, no, 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 you're gonna sell two and a half X. Oh. And we're like, holy shit. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> you know, like like that was unbelievable. Like the the segment leader, the the you know, the the my boss's boss's boss came in and basically told, you know, a couple thousand people, like, we I mean, this is still at the sales point. We hadn't, you know, we're not putting them out on out on the sites yet, but we knocked it out of the park. The specs for this, this product just hit the absolute sweet spot for the America's market. And uh, so that was a huge win. That was super exciting. Cause you know, you're, you're again, you're, you got a lot of trepidation. You don't know. You're like, all right, is the industry going to love this? We think so. We hope so. It turns out they're just like crazy over it. Um, so that was, a, that was a huge win. Um, I, I think another one was uh, another weird hat. I forgot this was a fourth hat I wore. Uh, when I got brought in initially, product manager, and then they're like, oh, yeah, by the way, we need somebody to manage the install of this new product's prototype. This product ended up being the 127, uh, but we didn't know really fully what it was at the time. Uh, so starting early, early, like, like step zero with that product and being with it all the way out to when we built this prototype, which ended up being the first ever 25127 built, um, watching that go from inception working with all the engineering teams and the suppliers and the manufacturers and all this stuff out to getting this installed on the site and watching the first time that that, uh, you know, those blades, those 127 meter diameter blades, just huge whole rotor lift get lifted up way up into the Texas sky and put onto the front of the turbine. I was just like, <laughs> wow, it's so cool. And you know what? Everybody had the same reaction. Everybody in the business was just uh, uh, in that segment of the business was super excited because this is that turbine we we were excited about. We thought that the world was going to love, and then, like I said, turns out that 127 we we they loved it way more than we even thought they would. As a second one, then the third one was more personal. I think um, it talks about I think the culture at GE Renewable Energy, which I which I could go on for days about. It's it's incredible here. Uh, but, you know, I saw this need with the data and analytics thing saying like, hey, we've, we've got a lot of questions being asked and really there's one way to answer them and, and we got to put together a team to, to answer them. So I put together a quick overview of what I thought that looked, but looked like, brought it to my manager and was like, hey, this is what it looked like. I think this is what it would cost. She worked with me to refine that message. We brought it to her leader and they were like, do it, go for it. Like this is this is the right thing to do, and and having that kind of engagement and then backing, and understanding that they want to invest in getting better internally speaking, they want to invest in getting better. They want to reduce that hysteresis. They are forward looking enough to know that this type of stuff is going to be required in everything we do in the future. 
and then have them say like, yeah, go for it, go wild. Um, you have no background in data and analytics, but but we think you can do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, well, no no pressure, right then. <laughs> yeah. No pressure after that. <laughs> and, uh, so that was like a year ago, and the team is is doing awesome. It's a really fantastic team, and um, we've got great support from leadership, and we're doing things that are used by the business. And uh, yeah, so I think those three would be big wins for me working for GE. That's uh, that's great. And, and that segues perfectly into my next question is a lot of our listeners are people in college, high school, technicians going to technician school, when technician school right now. And a lot of the questions that I get on LinkedIn or just mm-hmm. personal messages are, hey, what advice could you give me to accelerate my career in wind? Mm-hmm. I'd love to hear from you, somebody who came from you know, marine to oil rigs and now in wind and obviously doing a tremendous job leading a team at GE, what advice would you give to that person, either young or maybe starting out their career a little bit later on in life going into wind? Sure. So I think um, there's, it's different for each individual for sure. But, uh, you know, I think for any person across the board, working on that adaptability, just being like, and, and and showing that you can. Um, so if you're looking, you know, I, I always encourage my former oil and gas workers, you know, if they're looking to get out of there, okay, let's talk about the skills you have and how quickly you can ramp those up into applicable skills in the wind industry. Because there's, you know, when you're talking technician to technician, those are one-to-one. A lot of those skills, if you know how to use a hydraulic torque wrench, you can do it on a wind farm too versus an oil rig. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, transferable, adaptable skills. Um, You know, if you're like a a new employee, same kind of thing, or new, uh, sorry, recent graduate or some some younger person who's coming out of schooling, or even if you're an older person coming out of schooling, um, I would say your your biggest advantage is going to be, especially because I don't speak to engineering, I'm more of a technical kind of guy, just learn as much as you possibly can on the technical side of things. And if you're interested in getting in wind, just eat it for breakfast, like read about it, learn about it, listen to podcasts, do what you're doing and, and do more of it. You know, you're, there's so much information out there. Follow it in the news, stay current with what's going on, stay current with the politics, whatever, just as much as you can absorb. And this applies in like any job period, but let's say you know, you're specifically asking about wind. Just know as much as you possibly can so that when you come into it, you're at least somewhat conversant. You can understand a little bit of it. Um, and then, man, just have a good attitude and, and work your tail off. Uh, and uh, last one, uh, I'm an advocate of LinkedIn because I think it allows you to efficiently manage a really large network. Leverage your network and, and don't feel uh, like slimy about it. You know, some people have this, uh, they get a little off put by the, networking thing like go out and network and say oh i don't want to like try and harass somebody to give me a job like no, no that's not what you're doing you know you're just talking to these people and trying to find something like you and i are something that we can talk about in common whatever that is and if you find that when you're you know you're trying to network with somebody by just finding something in common with them you know and you're wor- working that with wind and you find something in common with that person stay in touch with them you know keep in touch with them and that's 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 the best way you can do it because uh, it's really helpful getting any new role to have somebody kind of on the inside to say, hey, here's the lay of the land. Here's the type of roles we have open. Here's where the locations are. Here's the type of candidate we're looking for. Um, and sometimes that's tough to extract from just a, an online uh, job posting. That is, uh, that's perfect. LinkedIn, I would have to say uh, thank you to LinkedIn for <laughs> setting up this podcast. Um, yeah. It has been phenomenal. I know we're running short on time. I have one more question for you, uh, Ben, yeah. that I like to ask everybody. I'm a huge fan of Tim Ferriss. I don't know if you've read The 4-Hour Work Week or Tools of Titans. He's got a podcast on iTunes. It's one of the top in business every single week. I mean, millions of downloads. And he likes to wrap up a lot of his podcasts with one question. It's this. If you could place a billboard somewhere in the world where every single person could see it, what would that slogan or catchphrase or mantra on that billboard say? 
That's a heavy one, man. <laughs> heavy. I didn't send you over show notes prior, so this is off the, uh, off the cusp. Oh, man, that's a tough one because um, I spent a lot of my life working in some pretty gnarly parts of the world. Uh, you know, I was over in Africa, and I've traveled in quite a few other third world countries. Um, and so that changes my answer a bit. You know, if I was saying, like, oh, I'm going to put a, uh, a billboard in, in the U.S. where people start from a uh, – pretty level playing field, fairly level playing field. Uh, I think on the grander scheme of things, it, it, it is fairly level. Um, you know, for that type of billboard, I would say like, hey, like work hard, have a good attitude and just don't take no for an answer, like get out there and get some. Um, you know, cause you're starting literally at the top of the pile in the US. So, yeah. so go kill it. Like you are super fortunate to be in that position or, or in any really Western country, Europe as well. Um, so just go get after it and, 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 and there's no, I shouldn't say there's no, uh, you will do nothing but create more opportunities for yourself by having that kind of opportunity, uh, kind of attitude. Um, so yeah, I guess that would be, that's a long answer to, <laughs> to your question, but that's a tough one for me too, because just being frank with you, you know, when you start thinking about what would I put in Africa, um, you know, that's a that's a lot different story because because it wouldn't be that i'd say that's probably the best answer that we've had for this particular question <laughs> and of course it comes from the data and analytics guy to think okay where is this located who's actually reading it and most of the time it's a generalized catchphrase but i love the way that you dive into things everything that you do it seems is all about data all about analytics you're driving the growth of the wind industry at ge through your passion, quite frankly, and your enthusiasm, and obviously your tremendous work ethic and networking that you've been able to do. I've enjoyed this conversation, Ben. I really hope that we could stay in touch and, um, you know, hopefully watch each other grow throughout the industry over the next decades to come. Yeah, Dan, well, thanks a lot for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And uh, I enjoyed the conversation as well. You, I can tell it's quite apparent you've got a lot of enthusiasm as well. So, <laughs> I can say from personal experience, that's a, that's a, a, a pro and a con. So just hopefully you get all the pros. <laughs> I, I hope so too. Absolutely. I've, I've had to learn how to dial it back every so often, but I think the enthusiasm, especially early on, uh, all things considered has, has been a net positive for now. Knock on wood. So, yeah, ditto, ditto. Well, I appreciate it, Ben. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. You can hang on afterwards for a quick off the line discussion. Um, okay. But everybody, this was episode seven of the Kurzweil podcast. Thank you for listening.